28 to 32. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. Can you hear me? Okay. If you'll bow your heads, we'll start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for the time that we can come together, Lord, for your word, which we know is true no matter what, Lord. Help us to not just hear your word, but be hearers and obeyers, Lord, to live a life that is set apart and holy for you, to be a light to this world. Lord, especially as times seem to be so dark, Lord, help us to see even more urgency in how we live and the things that we do to be like Jesus in this world, to be his hands and feet. Open our ears to hear your words today, Lord, and, and apply them to our lives, to walk in step with the Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Where is your faith? That's the question that Jesus asked in these next verses. And the scripture that Mark read was similar to tell us how much we can trust God. But do you trust God when times are kind of bad? Do you trust him fully? The Greek word for faith is pistis. It's a noun. It's used almost 250 times in the New Testament. Pisteo is the verb counterpart, and it's, it means believe, and it's used almost 250 times in the New Testament. So there's a difference between believing and having faith. They're very similarly related, but one's a verb, one's a noun. One is the act of doing something, the other is the product of. So I ask you again, do you believe first? So where is your faith? Because if you believe, you should have faith that moves mountains. You should have faith in the times of troubles. But sometimes we kind of tarry on our faith, don't we? And that's human nature. There's nothing to be ashamed of. It's what happens. And we're going to look at this story today, and there's nothing wrong with asking Jesus to increase your faith. So I've got some scriptures I wanted to have you guys read first so you can be thinking about some, some of the things that mean more to your faith. So if you have a scripture, just speak out loud and let everyone hear. Joshua 1, 6 to 9. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. <clears throat> Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Psalm 27, verses 1 to 3. <clears throat> Psalm 91, verses 1 through 7. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the foul snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His 
feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Isaiah 41, verses 9 to 13. Do you believe God's word to you? Do you have faith? Do you especially hold on to these scriptures in the time that great storms come into your life? So where we're at in Luke's gospel, Luke has presented clearly who Jesus Christ is, that he is Lord, that he is the Messiah, he is the chosen one, he has authority and he has powers. And at the end of chapter 7, we see the response of proper worship when you come into the presence of Jesus, you think you're going to do one thing, but you just fall at his feet and weep because of who he is. And that woman did not know that Jesus was going to lay down her life for him. So we believe we must trust then in our teacher, our master, and our Lord. And I'll expound upon that later why I used all three of those verses, because they are in the scriptures that we read, whether you caught it or not. So do you believe... Where is your faith, especially in times of storms? So I've got a video that I want to go play also to get you. This is all setting you up for this story that seemed to be so little about Jesus being on a boat and falling asleep and the disciples wondering if they were going to live or not. It seems so silly from our perspective, but it doesn't seem so silly if you think about those troubles in your life and the things. Hold on to God's word because your God is still the same. He will always be the same. If he is with you, then who can be against you? Kim, when you're ready.
Do you believe God's word? Do you understand that his plan for you is the same? That his love for you is the same? That all those words that you read, those words that you heard, you can count on no matter how great the storm is in your life. I'll say again, the Greek word for faith is pistis. It's used almost 250 times, but it's only used 24 times in the Gospels. This is just information. And it's used zero times in the Gospel of John. But the verb, pisteo, is used 250 times also, almost 100 times in John. Because the Gospel of John is written so that you might believe. Whereas the Gospel of Luke is written so that you know what you believe to be true. And so that you live that, you understand the teachings of Jesus and he has presented this orderly account so that we can see this. And here comes this story that we're going to go over today. <clears throat> Pisteo is the act of believing to where you entrust yourself to the point where you have complete confidence in what is true. And therefore, because of that belief, you become committed to it and have your faith, the resulting noun that you're committed to God's plan for your life, that you're committed to the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, that you're committed to his will instead of your will, and his kingdom come instead of your kingdom, and that there will be troubles in this world. Don't be surprised. But not a hair on your head will be touched or harmed without that being in God's plan. So whatever is going on in your life, God is in control. He's big enough to take care of it. He cares for you. But that doesn't mean that you don't have to go through the storm to get to the other side. That's why we must fix our eyes on Jesus and realize there are other guys in the boat besides us that maybe one of them would have enough faith to say, hey, we'll be okay, instead of all of us falling down and saying, where are you, God? Do you care for us? <sighs> Pistis is the resulting noun of your belief. It is the faith that saves you but it is also the faith that you live by in every moment of every day. Use, Luke uses the verb pisteo to describe Zechariah and his non-belief when he's told God's plan for him. How can we have a baby? We're too old. God said it, didn't he? It's also used to describe Mary's faith, who said, I don't understand how this is going to happen, but let it be. The act of believing. It's also used, the next time it's used actually is in the parable of the sower or the parable of the seed. The seed that falls on hard ground where they can't believe. They can't pisteo. And that scripture goes on to say as a result can't be saved. The seed that falls on the rocky ground and they believe, they pisteo for a little while but when temptations or trials come, they wither and fall away. 
Not for you, O Christian, and your faith should be strongly grounded in the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ and every promise that is true in God's word for you. Luke uses the word pereo with the, when the seeds fall in the weeds. It's not related, don't worry. It means just to go forth. They go forth. But the problem is, is they go their own way instead of going the way, the truth, and the life because they're choked out by the worries of this world. Why do you worry? Why do you worry about what you eat or what you wear or anything else? But if you continue to go on your own way, there might be some growth, but it sure won't be a crop produced like it's supposed to be. Luke uses the verb kateko for the seed that fell on good soil of the heart. That means to hold fast to, to keep and continue to possess. Just like that life preserver that's, fought, that's thrown out to you when you're drowning, you don't just say, oh, thank you, here's a life preserver. You don't hold it out on one side. You cling to it because you knew you were drowning. You knew that you were going to die, and nothing's going to get that life preserver out of your hands. Oh, thank goodness for the Son of God who saved you from your sins from an eternity apart from God. So how does Luke use the, the noun uh, form of this? He, he uses it to describe the faith of the men who brought their friend to Jesus, the faith that would tear the roof off the building. And what was the result? It was used and Jesus said, your faith, their faith, has saved you. Well, we know that that's not a literal because I can't make you believe but that kind of faith, Jesus is saying, is, is the kind of faith that I'm looking for. That you act upon that, that you understand that all we've got to do is get this guy to Jesus and then let Jesus do the rest. It's used to describe the faith of the centurion. Remember, that's the faith that marveled Jesus himself as opposed to the marveling that Jesus has for the lack of belief, the lack of faith. And it's also used when the woman broke out in tears at Jesus' feet. And he said, because of your faith, you can go in peace. Wow. She can go in peace, but yet in the very next chapter, the disciples are fearfully afraid that they're going to die. And Jesus is right there in the boat with them. But since he's asleep, Master, don't you care that we're drowning? He was flesh and blood. He was tired. He was exhausted. He needed to sleep. Now, how he could sleep through this kind of storm, I don't know. <laughs> but even when Jesus was asleep, he was still God. He was still in control. And you know, he's in heaven now as your advocate, pleading for the Father, and he doesn't sleep. He's continually watching over you, pleading your case, saying, this is my brother and sister. Do you believe but now we see you, Luke use it where it's used in this way. Where is your faith? I think that's how Jesus said it. I think he was perturbed. I think if he got woke up and the first time he's got to rest, he's a little mad at the lack of faith. And he doesn't say, hey, is there no faith here? He says, where is your faith? What would you do with it? Put it in your pocket while I was asleep? Do you put it in your pocket when, when troubled times come or, or when you're ashamed of the gospel or whatever it is? You're supposed to wear your faith as part of God's armor so that you can quench every fiery dart that the devil throws at you. So let me give you some more things of what faith is. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is complete confidence in what we can't see, but we know for a fact is true. I'm paraphrasing. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, faith is a gift from God. It's the gift that saves you. In Romans 1, 17, the righteous will live by faith, which is quoting Old Testament scripture. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Ephesians 3, 17, Jesus dwells in our heart through faith. In Luke 7, 50, the woman was told, faith gives us peace. In James 2, 17, James says, faith without works is dead. Galatians 3, 26, we are, the, we are sons of God because of our faith. 
Galatians 2.20, we live by faith. Jesus living in and through us. Forsaking all other things, not living for anything else. Because those things have been crucified. 1 Peter 1.5, we're guarded and protected by faith. 1 John 5.4, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. 1 Peter 1.9, the outcome of our faith is the salvation of our souls. So what do you think it looks like in your witness, in your testimony, when troubled times come, when storms come in your life, and you act and live and speak as though you have no faith? Isn't that confusing to those that are watching you? Because it's that peace that you have, that joy in all circumstances, that love that you have for one another that lets people know that you are, in fact, a new creation in Christ Jesus. So what would ever cause us to doubt? Jesus asked, where is your faith? I know you have it, but why in the world are you not clinging to it now like that life preserver? Why would you be holding it to the side or casting it off and acting like you didn't have it? When you, something bad comes along, that's when you need your faith the most to carry you through. Isn't the things that happen common to, the, to those of the world, Gentiles and, and believers? We have faith, but what do we do when something shakes and rattles that faith? Do we hold firmly to it? Do we have peace? Do we have victory? Do we have joy? Do we have hope? Those scriptures that I read to you still. So what is faith again? Faith is believing and trusting. Let me put it this way in a simple equation. Now, two plus two equals four. Belief plus tr trust equals live. Because we are not called to live a fearful life. We are called to live a fearless life because of the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Though all be against me, I will not be afraid. I will fear no one but the God Almighty who has authority over my soul for all eternity. I will fear no evil for thou art with me. Faith contains two elements. Accepting as truth and then trusting in what you believe is truth. It is believing something to be true, plus trusting enough to actually rely on the fact that it is true. So if you lack faith, are you saying that God's promises aren't real, that these, His words aren't truth that we read to you today? So anytime you're doubting, start picking up Psalms and start reading. Read God's Word, and all those scriptures we had weren't all from Psalms. They're scattered all throughout the Bible to give us promises, to give us hope, to give us peace, to give us confidence. You know something is true, so you rely upon it as truth, and then you act or live. You see a chair. You look at it, you know the truth. It was designed and built for someone to sit in. And you have faith enough to actually sit in it. That's God's word in your life. Same example. So do you live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God? Do you trust him explicitly, especially in all the storms that's going on in your life? I don't know what they are. I know what some of them are in my life. And I know that I wither around and wallow in my self-pity and everything else at times. But then I go back to God as faithful. And the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man prevails. And I'll build an ark so that my children will enter it. And any scriptures that I can cling to and hold on to, because I know God's word is true, and I know that he loves me. And I know that he has given me new life so that I can live for him. Boy, I need to be firm in my faith. Jesus, please increase my faith. So if you hear and obey, then you're part of the family of God. But are you pleasing Him? That scripture says that He rewards those who desperately seek Him. That understand who He is. They don't wither around and, and worry about things. They follow God's commands and His leading in their life, even if you don't know where you're going. Hebrews 11.1 1 said, Now faith is the assurance of what we hope for, the certainty of what we do not see. That is faith. And the ancients were commended for how they lived by faith. Were they perfect examples? No. 
Do we see the righteous things they did? Yes. Verse 6, And without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who approaches Him, who believes and knows that He's real, must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earnestly seek Him. How can I do that if I can't trust Him? I can't even be in a relationship with my wife if I can't trust her. Trust is foundational in any type of relationship. Or that love's not there. You're, you're living a lie. You don't really have that relationship. If you're planting seeds and producing a harvest, then you must be pleasing to God, right? But it says, Scripture says that many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do these things? Didn't we even cast out demons? So don't just hold on to the fact of who you think you are based on the fact that you believe that Jesus died for your sins. Are you a new creation in Christ? Are you living by faith, not by sight? Jesus told the rich ruler that came to him that believe, that's not question in that story. And that's not a parable. This is a, a real life example. He said, if you want to be perfect, go sell all your possessions. If you want to be complete, not perfect in, oh, I have, I have gone past all sin, but in complete in your knowledge of who you are. Doesn't mean you're still not going to sin. Look at David, a man after God's own heart, and he had to have someone else point out his herocious sin. How could he ever do that? And each step in his sin led to something more outrageous. How in the world could he do that? But when you start taking a step off the right path, the way, the truth, and the life, then before you realize it, you're way down the wrong road. The good thing is, is you can always fall on your knees and turn back, and you'll be right back to where you started on that path, if you will. So let's look at that story for just a second before we get to the story out on the lake. Matthew 19, verses 16 to 25. Just then a man came up to Jesus and inquired, Teacher, what good thing must I do to obtain eternal life? I know I need to live a certain way. I know I need to do a certain thing. Why do you ask me what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Hear and obey, O Israel. Have you done that? Oh yeah, I've done those things. But do you truly trust God? Are, are you willing to give up your life for Him? Because that's part of trust. Which ones, the man asked. Jesus answered, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All of these I have kept, said the young man. Do I still lack anything? Am I okay? Do I have eternal life? I believe and I obey. I mean, that's pretty clear from this scripture. And Jesus didn't question him in that. And the other disciples and around didn't question him. They probably looked at, hey, look, this guy's coming. Woo, we got a good guy for the team. This is the running back we're looking for. Well, not if he doesn't have faith that the, the quarterback's going to throw in the pass or faith that he can catch it or faith in the coach. Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Well, wait a minute. These are the things I trust in more than you. I don't trust you enough to let go of these. So I'm drowning. I'm out there in the ocean and you throw me the life preserver. But I think just because I have a swimsuit on, I'm safe. See how silly that is? I would cling to that life preserver that's thrown to me. If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Boy, that's even more than what I have now that I'm holding on to if I, if, if I could just see that point of the story. And then come follow me. The man believed, the man obeyed, but he lacked the faith to trust Jesus. Where does that put him? When the young man heard this, he went away in sorrow because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it's hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Isn't this what our question was? Will I have eternal life? Will I enter the kingdom of heaven? Because if I don't enter the kingdom of heaven, where, what kingdom am I entering in? Actually staying in and dead in my trespasses and sin. Verse 25, when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, amazed, perplexed, bewildered. 
And they asked, Who then can be saved? When Jesus looked at them, he said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Faith saves you. You are a child of God. And then you walk each and every step of the life that you have as a new creation in Jesus Christ by faith. So what does your faith look like? Especially in times of trouble. Step one is hearing obeying equals children. Your faith has saved you. You've been re revealed the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. The seeds have fell on the good soil. Those of noble heart, good character. Luke 8, 15, But the seeds on good soil are those of noble and good heart. The ones that Jesus called and they accepted it. The seed has been planted. They hear the word, which is believe. And step two, the next words, cling to it. If you believe and you don't cling to that belief, all those scriptures that I've said to you, do you really believe? Or are you like, let's go back to those that are choked out or those that didn't have much root? Because if you believe, you cling to it, you trust. And by persevering, let me read that again. That's Luke 8, 15, because it sets this story up even more as we're reading along. Because Luke writes an orderly account. But the seeds of the good soil are those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, cling to it, and by persevering produce a crop. It didn't stop with those who had good and noble heart who hear the word. That's the faith that saved them. The faith that they live by is they cling to it. And by persevering through the hard times, through the drought, through whatever it is, they produce a crop. You realize that Jesus is the light of the world, that he lit you so that you can shine. And in Luke 8, 18, three verses later, Jesus says to listen carefully so that you don't hide your light, but instead you put it out for all to see. How silly would it be to, to hide your light? Listen to all of God's promises. And if you do, if you keep reading the scripture there, you will be given even more. So if you have faith in the troubled times, oh, guess what? You might get more troubled times, but it's to increase your faith so that God can use you even more. So that you can go out to fight a giant and say, hey, the God of Israel is the one who will fight my battles. All I need is my sling and some stones. How silly is that? Why are you coming at me with sticks? Am I a dog? <laughs> no, I come at you with the God of Israel. That's faith. You have sa saving faith. But what about when a storm comes up? And in this case, it was a sudden storm. Luke 8, verses 22 to 25. One day, that's how Luke starts it off, just one random day when life is going good, whoo, you get that phone call. You fall down on the ground and you can't get up. You get confronted with this, whatever it is. One day, everything looks like it's good. You just got on a boat and was taking a joy ride to the other side of the lake. This is going to be good. We're going to get some rest. We're going to get to hear Jesus teach. We're going to let him rest. You know, whatever it is, this is just a good day. This is not a day that we planned anything great. This is just a day we're going to go to the other side of the lake. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. Well, on those days, you've got to stop and think because we rarely do. <laughs> this is my step that I've made today, but what are God's plans totally in my life? What's on the other side of the lake? Why are we going? Why am I doing this? Is, is the Spirit compelled me to do this? Is this just today? Who am I going to encounter today when I go to the lake? Who am I going to take with me when I go today? What am I going to do if my plans get messed up? How's my testimony going to be? It's just an ordinary day that we're going to get on a boat and set sail to the other side of the lake. So they got in the boat and set out. Verse 23, as they sailed, certain things happened. Jesus was a man. He was a human being. He was tired. He fell asleep. If you read the other Gospels, you know he got him a pillow. He deliberately laid down. He didn't just fall asleep. He didn't ignore them. He was like, 
I'm bushed. I'm going to sleep, guys. You got it from here. But then something, the second thing that happened after Jesus fell asleep, a squall or a tempest came down on the lake. No sign, no warning, just those storms that come and threaten your life. But where is Jesus during those times? In this case, he was asleep, but that's okay. The storm was so bad that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger or jeopardy. The disciples went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown, we're going to perish. How long did it take to wake them? These were experienced sailors. They'd been out on rough seas before. This must be a bad storm. And they knew their master was asleep. They knew he was a human being. They knew his authority and power on everything. But at some point they got so scared where they had to cry out to him. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay? Even if you have little faith, cry out for increased faith. I don't know how Jesus slept through it, but they woke him. He got up and he rebuked. This is the same word used for the fever of Peter's mother-in-law and the same thing for the demon that um, Jesus sent out a guy at church. He rebuked the wind and the raging waters. Did they have ears to hear? Was this statement for them? They, they heard and obeyed however that functions, but I think these words and what happened are more for us, aren't they? The things that happen, the, the struggles that happen in our life that produce perseverance to increase our faith. The wind and the raging, he rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. That doesn't mean it was just peaceful. It was like smooth as glass, not a ripple on the ocean, which is, <laughs> if you've ever been to Sea of Galilee, that you don't, don't think many times you'll see no ripples on the, on the lake. Verse 25, where is your faith, he asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? What manner of man is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Where is your faith? That's what Jesus said to them. That's the words in red. That's the words we're going to concentrate on here more than anything. But let's look at Mark's account to get a little more clarity to this. It's in Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41. That day when evening came, now I got a little more clarity. Evening came. This was after a long day with crowds pushing Jesus. Oh, I, might, I need this healed. I need that healed. I came to hear you. I want to be your disciple. And Jesus knows their hearts. Okay? He's had a long day. It was late in the evening. The crowds had pressed him. He was tired. And he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was. That's an unusual statement. And I can't tell you exactly what it means by any means. But not showered, not shaved, it, it tired, no preparation for the trip. I'm just so tired. Let's get out of here, guys. Let's go to the other side of the lake for whatever reason. <clears throat> so just as he was with, with, just as he was in the boat, there were also other boats with him. Oh, didn't know this. Well, that makes me think that there were at least 12 disciples following full time, but there were other disciples. There were women that were following. So we don't know how many disciples were there in the boat, but what we do know is it says he left the crowds behind. So these are all people that he's going to teach more intimately now. Oh, so maybe this storm is to teach them that. Okay? <clears throat> Was there 12? Was there 70? Was there 120? We don't know. Verse 37, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. So the boat was going down. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, okay, we've got the story here. They didn't just go wake, to wake him. The storm got really bad. How Jesus didn't wake up, I don't know. Maybe a spiritual thing. But it got to the point where the boat's almost going under. So I don't know. This storm has got so bad, I can't see any more hope. I might have had hope early on, but they, I didn't know all this was going to happen to me, God. And they cry out to him at that point. And in Mark's 
account, there's the word teacher. Different word, different meaning. Teacher, don't you care if we're drowning? Jesus got up, rebuked the winds and the waves. Quiet, be still. Now we know what Jesus said, or at least part of what he said, because we don't know if there were more words or not. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to the disciples, Why are you so afraid? Oh, so what caused them to hide their faith, to put it away? Because they didn't lose it. They didn't lose their faith. When Jesus asked, Where is your faith? It was because fear was stronger than their faith in this instant. And then in Mark's count, do you still have no faith? Whoa, wait a minute, Jesus, you know we have faith. So we, we know that this can't be that he had no faith. It's just like if you say everybody in, tur- in, in town turned out to vote. That means it was a higher vote count than normal. doesn't mean every single person. But he's saying their faith is so little, it's unrecognizable at this point because of this incident. Verse 41, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Now that word that Mark uses is stronger than the word that he uses before. We were scared for our life when the storm came, so we woke you, teacher. What do we need to do? Teach us. And now they are blown away with their fear because Jesus gets up and rebukes the wind and the waves. Why? Let this get more personal here. Why would you be so fearful of Jesus? You knew all that, or would you just be fearful because you should have had faith and you didn't? And you're standing in his presence now. You know, there will come a time when you will stand in his presence and you'll be accountable for every idle word and thought. And that ought out of holy fear make us live a life that brings glory and honor to God. Because when you come before him, just like when the woman came at his feet, you might think you're expecting one thing, but you're going to break down because you're going to know you're in the presence of God Almighty and he's going to know your thoughts especially in those times of storms. They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the winds and waves obey him. Am I? I throw that in there. It's not in scripture there. That's mine. Am I obeying him? Especially in these times? And I look at his words. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Oh, let me go back to the words to the wind and the wave and throw them in there. Because again, I told you they didn't have ears to hear. Quiet and be still. (laughs) How many times is that all we need to do? Be quiet with our thoughts, be still in our mind and know that God is there. Because that might be the times where we hear him. In Matthew's account, Matthew 8, verses 23 to 27, then they got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake, so we know it's without warning, so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, that's why I said I would tell you before why, what I meant with master and teacher and Lord. And Luke's account was master, master. You are our master, You know you're our master of all things. Really? I'm master in the storm? Teacher, teach us. I'm trying to teach you, but you're letting the storm prevail in your life rather than my peace and my joy. Lord, save us. I have and I always will. Do you understand these things in the time of the storm? We're going to drown. Jesus replied, you of little faith. Why are you so afraid? The reason you have little faith is because you are so fearful. It's okay to have a little fear, but you know that God is in control. That will bring you the peace. But as you let that fear progress and the storm get more violent, the fear get grow, grow stronger and stronger, it's swamping out the trust that you have in God. Little faith comes from fear rather than trust. The stronger the fear, the less faith and trust you have. Why is this? Why do we have faith and fear rather than belief and trust? Faith plus fear equals what? You fill in the blank. Belief plus trust equals live. I gave you that simple equation before. Why are you so afraid? 
Why do you have little faith? Where is your faith? What did you do with your faith? That faith that saved you and cleansed you and made you a child of God. Did you put it in your pocket for a later day? If you can't survive this storm, how are you ever going to make it to the other side? And there's a mission field there. There's a man with a legion of demons. Did you know that? And I'm calling you to cross over the lake and have peace even in a troubled time. We tend to skip the journey, simply want to wind up on the other side, don't we? Especially when the journey's rough. If the journey's good, if it's smooth sailing, oh, let's go out and have a good time. But if it's a rough trip across that lake, we're going to think twice about doing it, aren't we? Thing is, we don't know many times when those storms come because they come suddenly. You know, we know we get older and, and things don't work and stuff, but when the cancer comes knocking at the door, wait a minute, that's sudden and I'm afraid. And you have every right to be, but don't let that fear grow. Extinguish that fear with your trust in God. The righteous live by faith. The gift of faith saves us, and the nature of faith will carry us to the other side. The day when faith becomes sight will come and we will finally be crossed over the river to the other side. But in the meantime, we've got a journey to take and you're not in the boat alone. And I don't mean just because Jesus is there. I mean you've got each other. So are you there comforting one another? Are you there strong in your faith when someone is weak? Are you there to give a helping hand a pat on the back? You see, none of the other disciples were asleep. There was another boat full of people. There's nothing in here about, hey, we need to help our buddies in the other boat. There's none of that. Why? Because there was so much fear that none of the other things happened. The journey of faith is supposed to be fearless faith that will conquer any kind of storm that comes up, no matter if it's sudden, no matter how violent So I ask you this question in closing. How is your storm faith? Father in heaven, we thank you for the gospel messages, for your words, all the words that we read, that we know that you're true. Why do we doubt, Lord? Help us to increase our faith. Help us to live a life. Let us realize that others are watching and that you are watching and that you care for us. And that we need to be a testimony. We need to be there for not only our friends and the church, but to all the world. That we do have a mission field. And we need to work together, whether we need to tie the boats together to give, to give more strength. Whatever we do, and lean on prayer and everything else. To know that we have a, a, a mission field. To know that there are people oppressed by legions of demons. And you have given us the power of the kingdom of heaven. The gospel message to present. So, Lord, help us to live, to persevere, and by persevering, produce a crop that we can be faithful children, children of fearless faith. Father, we thank you and praise you. I thank you and praise you for this church. Lord, bind us together with your spirit and with the truth and guide us into all righteousness, Father. Help us to be the hands hands and feet of Jesus in this world and not to be fearful. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us as we sing hymn 517, I'd Rather Have Jesus. <laughs> 